I remember reading this in in a, a tweet from someone and and like everything freezing and being feeling like I had been given like a secret that was going to unlock so many other things. And it was the phrase pills don't teach skills. And it was like, oh, oh, right. Like that's a whole different direction to approach this not as a medical thing that can be fixed by taking a you know a pill or several pills but as a more holistic strategic just look at how you do things and find ways to you know to make accommodations it, it removes a level of of i think guilt and and feeling of personal responsibility that there's just something wrong with you and you know that is a an elliptical journey that i've been on for a very long time and and like i mentioned my therapist has been a real real help in identifying where those problems are specifically around the idea of perfectionism and it took me a really long time to even see that perfectionism was a was a thing that i had a problem with ADHD Rewired, episode 365. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mention on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter, you can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups, and you can learn all about our intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. You can do all of this at our website, ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Jay Bushman. Jay is a writer working at the intersection of traditional and emerging formats. He won an Emmy for his work as a writer and transmedia producer on the groundbreaking series, The Lizzie Bennett Diaries, an interactive adaptation of Pride and Prejudice. His first book, Novel Advice, a collection of advice column letters written by famous characters from literature, is now available. Last year, Jay was diagnosed with ADHD and auditory processing disorder, and he's still uncovering the ways it's affected his life and his career. Jay, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me here, uh, Eric. Uh, it's really a, a pleasure. I'm really excited to kind of dive into to this today. Um, you know, for for a number of reasons. One, I think that you're like I just love even just the title of novel. It, it just like because it just is brilliant in so many ways. So, uh, congratulations on getting that that published. I also know it has been a hell of a year for you, hasn't it? Yes, it has been uh, a year. It's been two years, uh, um, you know, going back to the middle of 2019, where uh, a few things happened that kind of led to my discovery of auditory processing disorder and then ADHD and then writing the book just as the pandemic was starting and the whole process of dealing with that. It's been it's yeah, it's it's been a lot. And during this and during the pandemic, uh, I just knew you, you lost your father uh, to coronavirus. I did. Yes. And that was um, uh, I was about it was two days after I delivered the first draft of the book and he was sick for the last couple of weeks of writing it. And it was a real um, let, me, let me put it this way. If I had not learned a lot of coping skills specifically around ADHD and APD, uh, it, I would not have been able to get through the that period and and dealing with what happened. But it was, you know, it it it's still I'm still waiting for it to to kind of land totally. Um, I I never really have been a the type of uh, uh, you know, and, and it's funny, you know, with you know ADHD being 
uh, a dis- uh, distraction and having a lot of things sort of uh, trying to pull focus. I have never really been the kind of writer who was good at focusing on the work and letting the rest of the world happen around me. But I figured it out last year. Mm -hmm. Like I found that gear last year and it was um, it was the thing that got me through 2020. And um, some of that is good. Some of that I don't think is totally um, healthy, if I'm being honest. And uh, I'm still sort of I'm still sort of waiting for some of it to land on me. Mm. Because I want I'm wondering what what was it that allowed you to sort of keep uh, your focus on this book in the, um, you know, in the light of uh, losing your father? Um, it, uh, frankly, denial uh, mm. was a big part of it. So you're kind of bur- um, burying yourself in the work. Yeah, burying myself in the work. And when, you know, something so big and unthinkable happens, um, it was the thing that got me up in the morning was people are waiting for this. I have deadlines. And if I can work on that, I don't have to think about all the other stuff. And that was really helpful for a while. And in fact, I got a I got another job about a month after uh, my father passed. And they were like, oh, my God, are like, are you are you are you in the right headspace for this? Like, it's totally fine if you're not. And I was like, please give me something to do. Mm. Um, so I don't sit around and have to think about this. And so I I really credit, uh, both the book and then this other job, um, with helping me get through a good chunk of 2020, um, to the point where it felt a little bit safer to, to deal with, uh, some of the, the grief and the fallout from the loss of my father. But I mean, if I'm being honest, I haven't really because of with the pandemic, my mother, who also got very sick um, with coronavirus and recovered, uh, lives in uh, in New Jersey. I live in Los Angeles. My sister mm-hmm. lives in Northern California, and neither of us have been able to go home to to be with our mother now in almost a year. Um, and part of that makes makes it still feel unreal. Yeah. So I know that that's gonna it's gonna come barreling down on me when I least expect it. Um, I think the other part of it is. Uh, the importance of having a, a, a good therapist. And I am oh, amen to that. incredibly yeah. fortunate in that after a lifetime of mediocre to adequate to bad to actively harmful therapists, <laughs> um, I about eight years ago started working with a therapist who has been really incredible and a great match for me. And The work I've done so much work on myself in the past eight years that um, not saying I was ready, ready for any of this, but I'm in a much better place to handle some of this unthinkable stuff than I would have been before that. Was it through the work that you were doing with this therapist that led you to the um, auditory processing uh, and then ADHD diagnoses? Partially. Um, I will say that I bl- I'm convinced that it was a lot of the work with the therapist that allowed me to be able to feel and be present enough to start recognizing things that then led to the auditory processing disorder. One of my chief coping mechanisms or defense mechanisms for most of my life has been dissociation. And that sense of just like, you just like shut down and you stop feeling things and starting to attack that as, as an issue and learning to be able to feel sensations and name sensations and understand or, or just lock into or clue into how things are feeling in your body. I mean, I, like a lot of ADHD people are really good at intellectualizing things. And I spent many, many years working with my therapist on, uh, on ways to get out of that habit. And what what kinds of things would your therapist help you with to, uh, to do that? Well, I mean, the first thing was always anything you're feeling is valid. 
and getting out of the habit or the practice of self-centering or intellectualizing, which I mean, I still do. It's because I, I like to, because I'm interested and it's like, well, what does this mean? And what it goes into that? Um, she's been a really incredible partner to chase down whatever rabbit hole I want to chase down. Um, and is very encouraging of going wherever, um, wherever it feels like we need to go. Um, she's also sent me to other practitioners, one in particular who uh, I spent some time doing somatic experiencing um, work. Talk which... about that a little bit, if you will, because I this over the last several months, I've, I uh, I went through and did a uh, um, got a certification for uh, as a as a trauma. Um, I don't even know what the certification is called. Yeah. It was like a 26 hours, uh, trauma right. certification for therapists. And, uh, so part of this was looking at somatic experiencing, which like on one hand, it seems about as woo woo as it gets, but on the other hand, it's also like, as the more, you know, we're learning about trauma, like trauma lives in the body. Yes. Yes. And all of that, um, that work, uh, has re it was a really monumental breakthrough for me. And, you know, it, it sort of came out of, I'm always sort of, I read a lot and I think a lot and I care very much about the words that we use to describe a lot of these things. And, and one of the biggest challenges or problems for me and with therapy and, and, and self-work and, and this even extends to ADHD is, you know, the words we use are often imprecise and the words we use are often specifically the verbs we use are often really soft. Say more. You know, as a writer, one of the things you're, you, you're taught early on is that active verbs are better than soft verbs. And, you know, soft for things like believe and feel and understand. And, and these are kind of vague. And how do you actually do that? Like, what is the action behind that? And I get really sort of spun up by like getting uh, advice or instructions with these soft verbs because I don't know how to do them. And the other the other angle to this that that. I, you know, and I'm, I'm still working my way through how to articulate this really clearly, but I feel like we confuse actuality with metaphor a lot and we use metaphor to understand things and then bank our identity on these metaphors. Can you give an example? Well, I mean, this is a thing that I've, I've thought a lot about and specifically with ADHD, which is, you know, I'm going to try to find the right way to say this because I do not want anything I say to be interpreted as diminishing anyone or what, how they feel about what their experience are. But ADHD itself is a metaphor. It is a description of a collection of experiences, but that's not the same thing as we can see on a, on an MRI or we can see in actual data or actual, you know, something, uh, an observable phenomenon in the world. That's not to say that that's anything about the validity of it, but I, and, you know, I'm, and I apologize for this is sort of looping all over the place in my history, but, um, I spent a long, long, long time dealing with chronic pain. Okay. And I would go to some doctors and they would go, you have fibromyalgia. And I'd be like, okay, what's that? And they would tell me what fibromyalgia was. I'd be like, oh, okay, I have fibromyalgia. Then I'd go to another doctor and say, yes, I've been diagnosed with fibromyalgia. And they would say, that's not real. And you go into that space long enough. And what, at least what I've learned or what I've adopted to, to deal with that is to not let the terms define me. Like whatever you want to call it, like fibromyalgia, um, uh, chronic pain, um, trauma response, dissociative trauma response. These are all great metaphors to help try and understand part of what's happening in the body, but they're not the actual thing. And the best example I can give of this is I was diagnosed with auditory processing disorder by an audiologist who showed me the data who showed me, look, here are your responses and here's what happens when this happens. And when this happens, we think this is this disorder, which is a set of several overlapping 
things that describe the way the brain interprets audio signal. And so the first part of that is like understanding, accepting that, okay, this is a thing. This is a description of how my mind works when it comes to to, um, auditory information. Great. What do I do about this? Then I started looking into, all right, what do I do with auditory processing disorder? And I found almost nothing that was useful because the assumptions behind auditory processing disorder are we need to do something about your hearing. It's not about the hearing. And the assumptions of auditory processing disorder are 99% geared towards children and the learning environment. None of this helps me. But this was how I found my way into the ADHD world where, and then, and I even went to, I was seeing a, uh, a, another doctor at this time. And I went and I talked to him about, this was the, the, my psychopharmacologist who prescribed my Adderall. And I said, Hey, I, you know, I saw this audiologist and they diagnosed me with auditory processing disorder. And he was like, yeah, it's the same thing. It's just dopamine. And part of me was like, okay, that's useful information that like, there's a concordance, but also it's the same thing is a huge statement to make about, you know, these two worlds. So I have adopted a, an attitude or I've adopted a position of, I will, if you have something that I use and it works for me, that's wonderful. And I don't care what you call it. And I don't care where it comes from. So what I have found was that when researching auditory processing disorder led me to reading a lot of people online who are writing about their experiences with ADHD and reading those, I was like, it was like reading about myself Mm. and I was like, okay, maybe this is something I should, uh, I should investigate. And then I got myself, I got a, I got an evaluation for ADHD, not the first one I've had in my lifetime, but this was the most thorough one. And they came back and they were like, "Eh, yeah, ADHD inattentive. That, that makes a lot of sense. And it was like, it wasn't like I needed it for myself at that point, because I had already started adopting all these tools. Um, Do you think at that point you were more ready for it? I was ready for it, but I was also, I had found things that were really helpful. And so honestly, it didn't really matter to me whether or not they said, yes, we're going to diagnose you at this point or not, because I was already acting as if, and I was already finding uh, things that were helpful. And I was, and I think the really important thing was I had found people and places and resources, um, including your podcast which really helped me recontextualize a lot of the issues that I've been dealing with through this lens. Um, And I found that it was the people with ADHD who were creating content and just talking online about their own experiences that were so much more helpful in figuring out how to navigate this on a day-to-day basis in my life and in my career and in just every part of my world than anything I ever heard from a doctor. And I'd spent so many years going to doctors asking for, hey, help me. Like, what am I supposed to do? And they would give me a narrow prescription from their specific viewpoint that it's not that it, and it's not that it didn't work, but it worked up to a point, but it was only attacking one part of the problem. Whereas looking at it through the lens of ADHD was this holistic um, leveling of everything that was like, oh, I, I think of it as like, going with the current instead of going against the current. So I do want to hear some of the things that you found to work with you, uh, for you. But what I want to do first is take a quick break and then we will be right back. Support for this podcast comes from the ADHD Rewired coaching community, which includes our intensive coaching and accountability groups and our alumni membership community. It's a Moira Mabin, everyone. Moira Mabin, ADHD Rewired coach and the host of the ADHD Friendly Lifestyle Podcast, which will definitely be out one day. One day. Hey, Eric. Hey, Moira. How's it going? Pretty good. I'm very excited to be here. I think that was my line. It's okay. <laughs> you just stopped. I know. 
Moore, I'm so excited to have you here right now. Do you know how long I have been wanting to bring other coaches on to facilitate coaching and accountability groups? Before you get all sentimental, let's tell everybody what's happening this Thursday. Because don't they have to RRSVP by tomorrow? Right. So Thursday, March 4th at 11.30 a.m. Pacific, 2.30 p.m. Eastern, we're hosting our next registration event for our spring season of coaching and accountability groups. And if you've been wanting to join one of Eric's groups for a while, but a session times didn't really work for you, I will be leading my second round of coaching groups at 6 a.m. Pacific. That's 9 a.m. Eastern. But if it's 6 a.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern is way too early for you. Then you can join me at 9 a.m. Pacific, just 12 Eastern, or Section 2 is at 11.30 a.m. Pacific, 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Go to coachingrewired.com. We have all the session times and a time zone conversion chart. I have no idea what I'm going to say here. <laughs> but but the script says it's supposed to be inspiring. I know I want it to be inspiring. And I was thinking, well, there's podcasts from episode 350 that, that you and I are on together when we did my mastermind. Um, I am going to have a podcast out in March. And this is just the most amazing experience I've ever had being part of ADHD Rewired. All right. So, you know, it's kind of funny because when we were talking about this at the end of last year, um, sort of the, the vision was to have you have launch your podcast and then people would kind of get to know you at this point through your podcast and uh, and we would get registration for uh, you leading a group. And then it sort of happened that last season, we like way overbooked our coaching groups. We took it as an opportunity to have you do your actually first group and you did it. You led a six person group and we're now going into the eighth week of that group. What's What's that been like for you? It's been pretty wonderful. The people have been amazing. They're a wonderful group. And being able to run the program, having been a participant and then an admin for several seasons and being mentored by you, it's been, I think, a positive experience for everyone. I want to play something for you. I don't know if you've heard before. Last season when you were an admin in our uh, in our last session, when people are kind of talking about their experience with the group, here's what someone said. I am such a fan of Mora. If I could join her fan club, I'd be the first member. The first fan moment, it was our pre-mastermind meeting where there was a couple of minutes before the guys joined in. So it was just us ladies. And I was like, I'm so tired and out of it today. And it's, and she revealed to me, I didn't know that ADHD symptoms fluctuate with the time of the month and hormones. And she dropped a whole lot of knowledge about ADHD and women and hormones and all this stuff. I don't know how I didn't know it before, but it was like, boom, like, wow. <laughs> That's awesome. You know what she said? What? Also her knowledge of how there's different medication needs depending on like different symptoms you have. I was like, wow. And I had so much information to share with my doctor and he didn't know. It was like, wow, this is really cutting edge information. I, I am known to be cutting edge. So join me or our newest Cutting edge coach Moira Maven. Go to coachingrewired.com to register. That's coachingrewired.com. So, if you are listening to this after March 4th, our last scheduled registration event is March 18th. Group starts April 7th. Space is limited. Registration is by invitation only. Go to coachingrewired.com to register. Get real time section availability and more. Go to coachingrewired.com to register. Can you hear my son yelling? <laughs> Website again is coachingrewired.com. And we are back with Jay Bushman. So, uh, first part of this uh this conversation you were kind of telling us a bit of your your journey and the, the story of discoveries um working with your therapist finding out uh that you had adhd through some of the reading you've done uh or on auditory processing disorders um history of of, of uh pain issues fibromyalgia um but you and some of the things you have found through this discovery have been helpful and other things not um which is also it sounds like has been part of how you have learned to sort of conceptualize how you kind of show up in the world with ADHD. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And it's been, 
It's really been exposing myself to the community and, you know, reading the contributions that that people have had. And there was one particular phrase, and I, I don't remember where I first saw it, but I remember reading this in, in a, a tweet from someone and and like like everything freezing and being feeling like I had been given like a secret that that was going to unlock so many other things. And it was the phrase pills don't teach skills and it was like oh oh right like that's a whole different direction to approach this not as a medical thing that can be fixed by taking a you know a pill or several pills um but as a more holistic strategic just look at how you do things and find ways to you know to make accommodations it, it removes a level of of i think guilt and and feeling of personal responsibility that there's just something wrong with you and you know that is a an elliptical journey that i've been on for a very long time and and like i mentioned my therapist has been a real real help in in identifying where those problems are specifically around um the idea of perfectionism and it took me a really long time to even see that perfectionism was a was a thing that I had a problem with. When it was for, when your therapist was first bringing it up with you, you were like, no, I'm, you know, it's. I And I remember like I had one of those great like moments in therapy where like you say a thing and then you like hear what you just said and you go, wait, what? Mm -hmm. And I remember her saying like something about, you know, the difficulty of perfectionism. And I, was, and I was like, no, it's not that it's not perfectionism, because the stuff that I do, it's not even good enough to qualify for perfectionism. <laughs> and she just like let that sit there. And I was like, oh, man. But it was a really it was a huge sort of shifting point for me, because what I realized was that. And this is what I get, but get to get back to what I was saying before about how the way we use language to describe these things, the way we usually talk about perfectionism is not what perfectionism feels like from the inside, right? When you say like, like, oh, perfectionism, it's like you do a good job, but if you work really hard, it can be that much better. But that's not what it feels like. It feels like everything I do is garbage and I can't show it to anyone. It's not, this is 98% good, but if I work hard enough, I can get it to 99 or 100. It's, this is 10% and I'm embarrassed and I can't show anybody anything. And making that sort of mental switch to like, oh, that's what's happening inside your head. Man, I, I just, I just want to tell you, Jay, like sitting here right now, I, I've been working on my own perfectionism for years, for years. And, you know, I talk about it a lot. I, I wrestle with it a lot. Um, and, and most days I think I, I, I win that battle, but hearing what you just described gave me like goosebumps because it was so viscerally real. Right. Right. It's like, and, and, you know, we're talking about metaphors, like battle is a good metaphor for this because you have to fight this every day. It's not a passive thing. You know? It is it's like, not. I'm like, it's good enough. It's done. Be done. Be done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it it means cultivating an attitude of I think this isn't good enough and I'm going to send it in anyway, which is so counter to everything that we've been sort of, you know, indoctrinated with. It's really, really hard. And, you know, it's funny, I was thinking actually earlier today when I first uh, when we first started talking about doing an interview, um, it was right after my book had come out, I was feeling like I got this licked. I have a great story. Like I beat procrastination. I wrote this book. It's fantastic. Like it'll be a great interview. But that was a couple of months ago. And I have to tell you, I, I'm in a completely different place right now because I'm trying to start the next thing and I can't do it. And Oh, well, let me rephrase. It's not that I can't do it. I haven't done You're it. Struggling with and it. You're struggling. And every single day is like, I just got to do the first thing. I just got to do the first thing. Okay, so so can I maybe like coach you a little bit right now? Absolutely. Okay. Because one of the things that I thought was so cool when you were talking about like the, the format for how you even got into this was you wrote a, a pilot TV script that you said you organized in like 80 modules like describe that because I think that there okay. might be something there that might help you get started. Yes. So this was this was one of the big discoveries of 
2020. And it's sort of connected to the book where, so the way that my book is structured is that it is a, a series of letters. So it's 73 individual letters. So you've got a letter from a character and then a letter from the agony aunt who is responding with the advice that, that they give. And give some context. Who are some of the characters? So for example, you've got uh, Ophelia from Hamlet who writes in and says, Hey, my boyfriend's kind of a big deal. Um, and uh, you know, he's under a lot of pressure when it's just the two of us, everything is great, but you know, there's all this stuff going on in our country and like, it's just putting a lot of pressure on him. And now my father and my un and my brother are telling me that I shouldn't go out with him and that he's just using me, but it can't be that bad. Right. Um, or, um, Ishmael from Moby Dick writes in and says, Hey, I was going to go, I met this guy. He's really cool. We're totally different from each other, but you know, we really hit it off like right away, even though there's a language barrier, but now he's talking about, should we go on a three-year whaling voyage together? And is that too much too soon? Um, and sort of trying to take these classic characters, uh, Lady Macbeth writing in with, you know, how do I deal with my husband? Dr. Jekyll is, you know, trying to figure out work-life balance. Um, and these sort of modern con the modern context for some of these classic problems. I love it. Uh, it was a ton of fun. It was a ton of fun to write, but, um, because it was structured in these little bits, the first thing I did was, all right, what are the 73, um, uh, individual pieces that I have to write. And then every day, all I had to do is one. And I just looked at what the next thing was. And it wasn't about, oh my God, I have to write 10,000 words or 40,000 words. I just have to write a two page. I just have to write the letter from this character. And then I have to write the response. And it was these little bite sized things. And at the beginning, it was really, really, really hard. And if I did one in a day, that was a good day. I, I, I but I was looking for some accountability to help me get through this and kind of on a whim i signed up for a workshop um the writer uh seth godin um who's written a whole bunch of mm -hmm. stuff about a lot of things but um he has a series of workshops um and he was starting one uh called the creatives workshop and the thrust of the creatives workshop was show up every day. You have to write a little something every single day. And it doesn't matter if it's good. It just has to be there. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, maybe this will help me like write, uh, write my book. And, and so I thought, all right, I'm going to sign up. And every day I have to post one thing, which means I have to write at least one letter a day. And just that little bite sized piece every day, all I had to do is one got me started. So in the first few weeks, if I did one letter a day, that was a really, really great day. And that, even though it was meant several hours of struggling with it. But by the end, I was doing four, five, six a day. Oh, wow. Because I'd gotten into the pattern. Yeah, I, you know, I'd started. And once I'd started, it started to flow. And that's how I got the book done. It just sort of kept me on track every day, shipping a little bit. Then that book was done. And I was like, all right, what's the next thing I'm going to do? And this is a resource I want to share with anyone who is interested in writing. Um, the context for this is specifically based around writing for television, but it is, I think, expandable or changeable to any other kind of writing you want to do. Um, there is a Canadian uh, uh, writer producer. Uh, named, her name is Jill Golick. And right around the time the pandemic was starting, she posted a thing on her website, which she called the Pandemic Pilot Program. And what she said was, hey, we're all going to be stuck inside. And now would be a, probably a really good time to, you know, write a pilot for a TV show. Um, and if you I'm going to do that. And if you want to do it, come along with me. And I have put together a guide on how to do that. And what this guide was, was just a PowerPoint presentation. And it's you can download it for free. Um, um, and it basically says day one, do this. Day two, do this. Day three, do this. Now, most writing advice, most books or, or writing gurus or writing teachers set up these systems where you end up talking a lot about, well, why do you do this? Why do you do it this way? What's the best way to do this? This was refreshingly free of most of that. It was literally day one, do this. Day two, do this. Set a timer for 45 minutes. Write this in 45 minutes. Take a 15 minute break come back, do the next one. And in, um, 
80, 45 minute sprints, it went from, I have nothing to, I have the first draft of a script. And I was like, this is exactly the same structure that Seth Godin's workshop had. I'm going to use this. And so I use that to write, I wrote, they call them a spec episode where you write an episode of a TV show that already exists. And I was looking for something fun to do. So I wrote a spec episode of Star Trek Discovery because I love Star Trek. My father loved Star Trek and it was a sort of a nice way for me to, you know, spend some time in that world and, and, and connect with him. Um, and so I used Jill's, um, PowerPoint program to write this, um, TV script. And it was like, I felt like I had found the Holy grail. And as I was working on it, I was like, how do I, I like, I, I took her program and I kind of changed it for my own needs and like expanded it to do lots of different things. And I was like, this is it. This is exactly how I need to do this. It's every day. You just have all the thinking about what you need to do is already done. You just look at what's the next, what's the next thing on the program and just do that. Just set them, set a, set a clock for 45 minutes and sit down and do that. And I was like, this is great. I will have conquered my procrastination from here till forever because now I have a system. Well, you still got to sit down and do number one. And that's kind of where I've been stuck for the past uh, uh, month or so. I am giving myself a lot of room to not beat myself up about this because A, this is hard and allowing myself to sit in the fact that this is exactly what is hard about having ADHD. It's not a moral failing. It's not something I can muscle through. It's just a fact of, uh, it's just the way the current is going. And eventually I'll get it. Um, also, I don't know if you've noticed this, but there's kind of a lot of stuff going on in the world right now. Yeah. And it's really kind of like scary. Yeah. Um, and unsettling. And that's real. And you can't just wish it away. And, you know, you know, ignore it and just work as usual. So I'm giving myself an enormous amount of slack, which is very, very hard for the perfectionist part of my brain who just wants to beat me up for not, you know, being further along. I I have some some thoughts, questions and ideas that I want to explore with you. I want to first take a quick break. And then when we uh, when we come back, we'll jump right in. So we will be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from patrons who give each month over at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. You know, I know some people don't love hearing ads on the podcast, and I get it because I haven't quite figured out how to write short ads to tell you about, you know, all the things. So if you love the podcast, but not the ads, become a patron giving it at least $5 a month and you'll get ad free episodes a day before everyone else. And at the $10 a month level, you can hear audio recordings for our monthly coaching call that we do with our $25 a month patrons. The ad free episodes and recordings of our coaching calls show up like any other podcast. You just have to do a thing with a magic link on the Patreon website and a little beep bop boop and voila, ad free ADHD rewired. Think about how much value you get from this podcast. Have you been listening for months or years? Has this podcast possibly changed your life? Do you count on this podcast each week? Have you shared it with people in your life because it helps you feel understood? What is that worth to you? Now, if you're not financially in a place where you can give, then don't worry about it at all. But if you value this podcast and the community and everything else that we do here, and you want to get some cool perks, make today the day you become a patron. Go to ADHDrewired.com and click the Patreon tab at the top of the page. It only takes a minute. And to get that Patreon RSS feed for the ad-free episodes and recordings of our monthly coaching calls, click on my membership once you become a patron. I really appreciate all of your support. By becoming a patron, you are helping me grow my team. And you're doing something awesome by supporting an ADHD-owned and operated small business that's hopefully making a difference in your life. Let today be the day you do a little bit of awesome. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon or click the Patreon tab 
over at ADHDrewired.com. And thank you. I really do appreciate all of your support. Want to be one of the very first people to join ADHD Rewired's adultstudyhall.com? ADHD Rewired's newest membership community for co-working with other adults with ADHD is coming late March. With dedicated Zoom rooms open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you'll never have to work alone again. And with our Adult Study Hall Plus sessions, one of our Adult Study Hall facilitators will help you stay on track. You'll be asked to report on your progress throughout the session. So whether you need to pay bills, answer emails, work on your book or website, or study for that big test. You don't have to do it alone. You'll even be able to schedule your own adult study hall sessions for other members to join you. Boost your productivity with real-time accountability. Membership is only $19.99 a month, but we're giving our first 100 founding members 50% off their membership for life, just as long as you keep your membership active. Go to adultstudyhall.com. Founding members join for only $9.99 a month. Some restrictions do apply. See the website for details. Website again is adultstudyhall.com. If you are new to the podcast, welcome to ADHD Rewired. Be sure to check out all of our other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired podcast network, including our newest podcast, ADHD Diversified. We also have Hacking Your ADHD, ADHD Essentials, and coming in March, the ADHD Friendly Lifestyle with Moira Mabin. Last week on ADHD Diversified, MJ talks candidly about what it means for someone with ADHD to finally be seen. Here, take a quick listen. I was just waiting for someone to see me, to try and understand what my brain was doing, or even just to listen without trying to fix me. It took someone else, and specifically someone I trusted, to become a mirror of sorts to show me that I wasn't alone in my struggles and that being different was okay. Hearing positive things from someone else, it slowly allowed me to give myself permission to not have to live in the pits of shame and guilt of something that wasn't my fault. Until then, I really had never allowed myself the permission to be vulnerable in that way. It took the right person someone who wouldn't judge me or make me feel bad about who I was and the things I've done or haven't done to show me what giving myself permission looked like. Permission. That was the domino that started it all. And you can join me and MJ and Will Kerb from Hacking Your ADHD and Brenda Mahan from ADHD Essentials and Moira Mabin, ADHD Rewired Coach and the host of the soon-to-be-released ADHD-Friendly Lifestyle podcast next Tuesday, March 9th, and every second Tuesday of the month at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern, for an hour of live Q&A. Come hang out with us and ask us questions and chat in real time with a bunch of other members of our community. To register for free, go to ADHDrewired.com slash events. That's ADHDrewired.com slash events. And we hope to see you there. All right, let's jump right back in here. So, uh, Jay, do you know what this next book, like, what, what is it going to be about? I do. Um, it's actually been an idea that has been in the back of my head for a long time. Um, and it's just sort of been burbling back there and it kind of like not, this is a thing that happens for me where it's like, I, I have an idea and it sort of tells me what it wants to be. And sometimes it, you know, says I'm not quite ready yet. And it just sort of like sits, sits in the back of my head. And yeah. every so often I, I can get, check in with I it. Relate to that, I'm like, yeah. Hey, is that, is, is it time? No, it's not time. And, th- and it, now it's time for this one. This one is, has come forward and said, now it's time to do me. And I'm like, okay, all right. Um, and I know what it is and I know where to start and I know what the first, the first, uh, step on the first sprint needs to be. And it's not even that difficult. I just haven't cleared the mental and emotional space to, to do it. So if you're saying that you haven't cleared the mental and emotional space, it sounds like that is the first step. 
Yes. And that is a, that is another hallmark of a lot of the work that I've done over the years with my therapist. Now, part of the challenge here is, I mean, this is a challenge for everyone, which I like to sort of lump under the banner heading of capitalism, um, which is I'm also working on some freelance writing assignments and those have deadlines Mm -hmm. and uh, I have to show up for meetings and I have to deliver work for that. And that's fine. Like, that's great. Um, but it's that old, you know, what did they call that? The Eisenhower matrix of the, mm-hmm. you know, important, important and timely. And the stuff that is my work is important, but it's not timely. And so left to its own devices, the people asking me for things are always going to get priority yeah. over my own stuff. And I had put in a lot of systems to sort of bulwark against that last year. Um, Those systems aren't working very well right now, partially because I'm doing a lot of other work and I have to find a better way to clear, clear some time for myself. Mm. Um, But I'm discovering that I need more, I need more time than I want to need to feel like I, 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 have enough room for the idea to sort of percolate before I just have to stop and go do something else. And it's that, that agitation that will keep me from getting started on the track. Hmm. Yeah. So if a couple, it's, there's always, there's never just one thought. There's always like yeah. nine and I'm trying to like follow one so I can like capture it to ask <laughs> you the question. Right. Um, you know, part of what, what, I'm hearing too, if I can relate, um, you know, my, my experience of the, over the last year, um, you know, I, I talked on, on Brendan Mahan's podcast a well, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I don't know when this, this episode will be coming out. Um, but in 20, beginning of 2020, I had asked my wife, uh, at the time for a divorce. Um, by the time this comes out, this will, will the divorce will be, the divorce will be officially over. Um, you know, she moved out December 30th. And so we're recording this now on February 2nd. And I would say last week and uh, a couple of days into this week is I really is the first time I've really recognized like I have mental bandwidth back. Like Mm -hmm. it's this sort of like discovery of like, oh, like all these ideas and things that have been percolating. Like because all of last year, last year was just about like I'm working on myself and like healing and like dealing with with, you know, trauma and and all this stuff that yeah. kind of led me to this point right and so in my in my work life i was like nothing new just sort of like you know make sure i can show up for my groups right but like it's it's it was um i want to say i was calling it in because I, I think I, I was very present when i was when i was in my groups but like there was not an ounce more than that mm-hmm. right and i'm just finding all just in this since a month out um and i've been working with a therapist every week since the beginning of probably november of la- of the year prior so like mm-hmm. i've done a lot of therapy work myself as well so i'm wondering what like is this the right time like what if you is it a possibility because you do have income coming in with these these so you know what like i love this idea that i want for this book i want to write let me shelf this. You like that pun? Get it? Shelf this book. Yeah. <laughs> let me, I didn't even realize until it came out of my mouth. But let me, let me shelf this for, might say, three months and mm-hmm. just see where I'm at. Let me just focus on the work right in front of me. Right. And let me revisit. Let me try to get started again in three months and give myself permission for the next three months. Let me just continue to work on healing and grieving and, you know, just, trying to to build back some of that bandwidth. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. And and while I'm not quite ready to to say 3 months, okay? Um I, I that's kind of how I've been approaching it on a day-to-day basis. And and this relates back to where we I think started at the beginning, which is dissociation as a as a coping mechanism. And the thing that I'm trying to, I'm trying to work through at this time is feeling like I want to do this, not feeling like I'm able to find the handle and that not being 
something I need to run away from. You know, like it's okay to feel this, that, that this might not actually be a problem to be solved yet so much as an experience to, uh, to, to live through. And, you know, I, I also feel like it, this is inseparable from the pandemic because on a much sort of larger societal scale, like, I mean, I don't know what, what things are like where you are <laughs> at the moment, but I'm in Los Angeles okay. where they, this is currently considered the center of the pandemic. And we have the new, uh, highly contagious strain has been identified here. and. Uh, they have recently suspended the air quality regulations for the city because of the number of cremations that have to happen. Um, and yet our stores are open and we are not under a lockdown and it's a really crazy making environment. So my wife and I just sort of decided a, a while ago that we're just not leaving the apartment if we don't have to. I, I go to the grocery store once a week. I go downstairs to get the mail. I had even beforehand was like, I, I found uh, riding my bike uh, to coffee shops and to the grocery store was like my main sort of, I get out of the house and, and, you know, I've, I've suspended that until things get a little, uh, a little better because our hospitals are completely full. And, you know, the last thing, that needs to happen is, you know, you get in a bike accident and they take you to the hospital and they can't take you in. So we're, you know, pretty much keeping things close to the vest right now. And so I, I'm, I'm trying to not fix too much. I'm trying not to change too much of the stuff that I changed last year and just kind of ride this out. Can you exercise at home by chance? Because I can. And the thing that I've done to sort of take that place is um, I have a lot of the a lot of the work that I've been doing over the past several years has been uh, interactive storytelling for virtual reality. And so Ooh. I have uh, an Oculus Quest 2 headset. And one of the best games on the Oculus Quest is a Star Wars game called Vader Immortal. And as part of Vader Immortal, they have a, a section of the game called the Lightsaber Dojo, where you learn how to fight with a lightsaber. And so every morning, I try and do this every morning. I don't do it every morning, but every morning I try to spend 15 minutes fighting with a lightsaber in my apartment, which is like if I if I'd known that this was going to be what my life was going to turn into when I was a kid, it probably would have been I probably would have been really excited. <laughs> Is there any way to channel some of that? Like, because I saw someone's giddiness and you know, when you were describing this. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Is there any way to channel some of that into your writing? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's the tagline. You say it at the beginning of every episode of this podcast, like starting at beginning is hard. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just, once I get started, I know it'll be fine. And, and I think, if the world would settle down a little bit, I think that would help quite a bit. I'm wondering, you know, like, yes, and uh -huh. what could we do so it doesn't depend on the world settling down? Um, I'm going through a process right now with trying to better define some of my roles on some of my freelance uh, assignments. Um, and that will go a long way towards carving out the space and the time. That means having some conversations, uh, which aren't always the easiest uh, to have. Uh, it means articulating my needs, uh, which is not something I've traditionally been very good at. But that's another part of this journey that, that I've been on. Can you write out almost like a script, like a character, and then use that to articulate your needs? I do actually. That's something yeah. I, I have. One of the things I've learned over the last year and a half is I have to pre-write all my notes before every call because I can't rely on myself to remember in the moment that, oh, I wanted to ask about this or I wanted to say this or this was what I wanted to get out of this conversation. Yeah, I, I will often put, like, put a, just grab a sticky notepad and just a couple bullet points and I just keep my finger on that like while I'm on the call. So it's like, okay, yes. this is why I'm on this call. You know, it's, so I don't necessarily script it all out, but it, like sort of like the, what are the outcomes I'm looking for? Yeah. 
and and approaching every one of these things with more forethought and thinking of it as i mean and that's not like the, a new idea like it's like oh hey no one ever thought of that before but for me it's thinking not of that as more work i need to do but actually making things easier because i've spent some time with myself going what do i actually want to get out of this and and pursuing that so that's an ongoing um that's an ongoing process and you know it's it's again something i'm going to shout out my therapist again something we work on a lot because you know when you live in this uh you know this is this adhd perfectionist um kind of uh, uh mindset that i've been in unknowingly for most of my life it's sort of sort of uncovering like oh no that's 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 not what's really happening that's just this maladaptive behavior you have you have created in order to get through this situation so let's try and look at this in ways that will allow me to you know maybe try something different um yeah. Jay, as as we're coming here to the the end here uh, can I ask you to maybe uh, give some novel advice to maybe the, <laughs> the creatives out there who are, you know, who are struggling with some of this perfectionism? Absolutely. Um, and I think all of this just comes from my own experience. I don't know anything better than, you know, anyone else. I've just banged my head against the wall of, of this kind of stuff for a really long time. I think the first thing I would say is it's really easy to mythologize your own problems. That's what writer's block is. It is mythologic is it's turning the your trouble writing into a myth and a story about why. And that story can very easily become the problem. And so it it turns it into well if I solve this other problem then it will be easier for me to write. And that doesn't change the fact that it's just hard to sit down and write no matter what. And accepting that and that it's okay is a huge, um, huge help. I think the other thing I would say is find other people who are in the same boat. Um, I am really fortunate to be part of a writer's group um, with some incredibly talented writers so much better uh better writers than i am um people who whose work is really incredible and and fun and affecting and i get to watch them have the same struggles i do and to not want to write and to think everything that they write is garbage and and to beat themselves up and to not want to do the work and still find ways to do it anyway. And just to be around other people who are working at a high level and seeing that none of this ever goes away. Like it never gets easier. It's just, it's just how it is. And that lets you let go of the guilt or feeling like I must be doing something wrong because this is so hard. It's just hard. Yeah. Um, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't like think you wouldn't feel bad because you couldn't lift a 400 pound barbell. That's heavy. It takes a lot to do that, right? You need to like get a lot of systems in place to help you lift really heavy things. This is the same way. It's just hard. Um, and uh, I think the other thing I would say is, and this I've learned from long experience, beware of anyone who wants, who has the solution if they can sell it to you. Mm. specifically with writing and, and there are a million people out there that will take your money to give you a system on how to make this easier but the people who really know will give that knowledge away for free mm. jay bushman thank you so much uh, your website jaybushman.com so uh, we'll put the link on the uh, the show notes page to this episode uh the book what's the title again it's novel advice, practical wisdom for your favorite literary characters. I love it. Go get the book. Jay Bushman, thank you so much for sharing your story. It's been a blast. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. 
This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find summaries and additional resources for each episode. You can apply to our free and secret Facebook community. You can learn more about ADHD Rewired's intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups and sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content you won't get anywhere else. It's all at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click the Patreon button. If you're a regular listener and you're still listening to my voice, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron through our Patreon page. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to listeners, but it is not free to produce. And patrons get really cool perks. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. You can also subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube and you can subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube and see select interviews and some other videos I've posted. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends and your family and your clients, as well as your coaches, therapists, and doctors. And if you're a coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader, and you would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at my website, ADHDrewired.com. And if you're a member of Chad or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this podcast. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. You know, you might be the person that turns somebody on to a podcast for the very first time. And if you really love this episode, please consider hitting share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I count on you to help me spread the message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and to help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher, or any other podcast app that accepts ratings and reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe on this podcast on your podcast app so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Not sure where to start? In no particular order. Check out Atomic Habits by James Clear. The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk. 10% Happier and Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. These are both by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions and Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Vaden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. Do you have trouble asking for help? Listen to The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. It's one of the best produced audiobooks I've ever heard. If you're looking for something a little bit more say magical i unexpectedly fell in love with the harry potter series and i don't usually listen to those kinds of books and i loved it and of course if you haven't yet boarded the Brene brown bus yet check out Brene brown's books starting with the gifts of imperfection daring greatly rising strong the power of vulnerability and if you're an entrepreneur or a leader in any capacity check out her 2018 book dare to lead and Brene still is my most wanted guest so if you know Brene you would be so kind to make that connection for me I would be really really grateful you know who else I would like to have on the show you click the podcast tab at ADHDrewired.com and then click the be a guest button at the top of that page and schedule a 15 minute pre-interview this is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning keep growing and keep connecting Self-care is not selfish, and no matter what gets done or doesn't get done, at the end of the day, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.